Yeah, again, it all comes down to what the song requires, what the sound is that you're going for. If you want it super tight and close and defined, if you want more vibe or both and you can do overdubs or whatever, it's just very important to have that plan before you start and not just think, okay, uh, like everybody does overheads, everybody does kick and snare, so that's what we need to do. This is the Self-Recording Band Podcast, the show where we help you make exciting records on your own, wherever you are, DIY style. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Tyne, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, mastering engineer from stonemastering.com, Malcolm Owen Flood. How are you, Malcolm? Hello, I'm great. It's been an exciting week. I got uh, a new microphone just on the weekend, so I'm excited. <laughs> Tell our audience what it is that you got. <laughs> it, it is the Slate ML1. It's kind of like a weird modeling microphone where uh, the idea is using software, you can change which microphone it is trying to be. Um, and apparently it works like a hot damn, but I uh, I haven't tried it yet. So <laughs> I'm excited, but I, I don't I like Benny, you said uh, just because uh, I told you I was all excited I had it. And you're like, oh, I, I actually have one. Yes. Um, so you said it was good. I know our, our mastermind uh, group member and who actually has been uh, a guest on uh, your self-recording band community as well. Uh, John McLucas, he's a huge endorser of them. He's, he's the one that convinced me to get it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I agree. It's amazing. I actually, and that, like tells you something about how, how good I find it to be. I actually sold my U87 that I had when I got wow. the Slate mic because I didn't use it anymore. And um, so it's a totally worth the money. <laughs> yeah, I love the like Swiss Army knife pieces of gear that just handle so many different situations. There's, exactly. Uh, like I got my Kemper, which handles 90% of my amp needs. And then I got this, which should handle... 90% of the microphone needs, I hope. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And by the way, this is, if you are recording vocals at home, if you're getting, uh, if you're planning on getting a condenser microphone, that would be probably on my list of recommendations because it's not the, the cheapest thing, but it's so versatile and especially for like home recording people, DIY recording stuff, or like when you can't afford many different microphones, it's just it's a very, very good option. Like either that or or like what we have already said, like something like an SM7 or something like that. But if you're going yeah. condenser, the Slate One is probably uh, worth looking into. Yeah. Definitely. And we're not endorsed yeah. or anything. It's just we both use it and it's it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Other than that, I uh, built a new bass trap in the studio and uh, that's exciting for me too. I love tuning my room. <laughs> So you yeah, have it I, in front of you, I guess, right? Because yeah, I can't see yeah, any exactly. behind you. Yeah, you can't see it on the video. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, the bottom corner in front of my desk, like so where the wall meets the floor. Um, it's kind of a little corner trap there. Um, and uh, it's kind of the last spot I had available, honestly. <laughs> there's, there's no more spots in my room to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you have the same problem as I have because your door is pretty close to the corner back there. So the mm -hmm. same, I have the same issue in my control room, so I can't treat those uh, those corners, or it would be I could, but then it, would, it would not be symmetrical anymore, and I don't like that. I like symmetry. Yeah, I can't handle that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, like, I see. But that's a very smart thing that you did here with the floor corner. I have to say that because that's something many people just overlook or don't think of doing. Like everybody puts like the super chunk bass traps in the corners, like where the walls meet meet mm -hmm. each other, but the the ceiling and especially the floor corners i don't see a lot of people treating those some put absorbers on the ceiling corners but the floor i i rarely see those but it's it's the exact same effect so it's just another corner that you can treat and it's yeah. actually pretty like i guess it's it's not as visible or not like it doesn't hurt aesthetic uh yeah really, yeah so. if you have the space in front of your desk it's like the perfect spot nobody nobody even sees it you can hide cables behind it uh you don't even have to mount it you know it just like fits in there <laughs> so it's, it's the easiest easiest one to do it's great yeah and you can't overdo it with those so if you are thinking about improving your acoustics the bass trap stuff definitely do it you can't overdo it like the you will never have a completely flat bass so um response so yeah i just had yeah. a by the way i just had a an amazing um workshop with Jesco lohan because you were talking yeah, about the guest say. appearance of uh with john mclucas and the community and i did the same thing with Jesco last week we had a an acoustics um q a session which was very great and um all of that will be inside the self-recording band academy so we did it live for the whole community so all the email subscribers and facebook group members could join 
but now the replay is only available as like a bonus um, workshop, bonus content in the Self Recording Band Academy that I am about to launch, by the way. So we're uh, very close by the time we're recording this. It's like a couple of weeks and we will be launching the Academy finally. I spent the whole last week uh, filming, um, outlining filming videos. It's it's a monster, of course, but um, like it's very digestible, small videos that are easy to consume and very well structured, but it's a lot of content. Yeah, if you're interested in that, if you're interested in um, getting a, like a step-by-step -step system that takes you through the whole production process, basically, as a self-recording band with um, a lot of videos, PDFs, bonus workshops, coaching call sessions, all that, um, you can sign up for the waiting list. And uh, if you go to the selfrecordingband.com slash academy waiting list, you can just easily sign up there and you're the first to know when it launches. Also, you get a, um, a better um, price, basically, because there will be a launch price and it will after that it will never be as cheap again. So if you sign up for that waiting list, you'll be the first to know when we launch. And I'm so super excited for that. It's been probably the most exhausting thing I've ever done since I'm a I'm an audio professional. <laughs> like it's <laughs> it's been a crazy big project and it's been going on basically this whole year. But I have a super cool beta testing community that I'm very, very grateful for. And they helped me get the course to the point where I'm really excited and I can't wait to share it and launch it. So if you're interested in learning and um, getting a full system on how to record yourself, go to the selfrecordingband.com slash academy waiting list. And I'm uh, glad to have you. So yeah, that's what was yeah. happening here right now. I like filming the course. <laughs> I mean, we're recording this a couple of weeks in advance from when it goes live. So yeah, if like if you hear this, go check it out because there's a possibility that it is already live, but it probably will be Almost live, I think, by that yeah, time. <laughs> I, I think so. I have to still implement some of the, the feedback that I got from from testers, but we, it will be, at least it will be close. So, yeah, exactly. Right on. That's exciting, man. Yeah, I can't wait. It's, it's super, <laughs> super amazing. All right. So, um, today's topic has nothing to do with acoustics or condenser, mi yeah, maybe condenser microphones, but nothing to do yeah, with vocals or acoustics <laughs> or any of the stuff we've been talking about. It has to do with drums again. We're back at uh, the topic of drums. And we're talking about something that many of you probably um, find valuable because it's a typical DIY scenario that you have an interface with limited uh, inputs, with limited track count, and you might want to record a drum kit and you maybe you have only four inputs. And if that's the case, or less even, and if that's the case, if you have like two or four inputs, we're going to help you get the most out of that. And in this episode, we're trying to give you some suggestions what you can do with those inputs to still capture the kit so that it sounds powerful and um, modern and that it can work in a mix, right? Mm -hmm. So where do we start with this? Um, I think we should start with the four-channel setup because I feel like less than that is still possible and we can touch on that a little bit but I think four channels is like the least amount of channels you need to get something that you can make punchy modern and big in a mix right yeah I, I agree and I think that's where a lot of DIY people are probably starting out because um, there's a lot of great and and affordable uh, four channel interfaces um, like the I know that UA um, Universal Audio is like starting to push a four-channel one pretty hard now, which is actually pretty expensive. But <laughs> but that's like a that's a good middle ground, you know, um, where it's like enough channels to do drums, um, but not so large and expensive that you're kind of like blowing your your entire budget on the interface. Um, and I know you know Focusrite, everybody does a four-channel, so I think that's going to be the most likely situation and and a good spot to to start. Um, even if we're talking to people that have like an eight channel or something like that, I bet there's probably, they, they might need those inputs for something else. Maybe they have somebody recording a scratch vocal live with them or something, you know? So four channels seems like the perfect kind of scenario for us to, to, to use as like a, um, a situation reference. <laughs> yes. And also I think it helps even for people with more channels because, because of what you just said. And also because I think it's worth trying to get a great drum sound with a limited amount of, of 
of inputs and then only add what you really need because some people tend mm. to start out with like 16 channels if they have them if they have a digital a digital desk or whatever and they kind of throw mics at the kit in hopes that it will be sounding great and it's uh, there's actually value in trying to get a drum set to sound good with as uh, less I can't speak right now <laughs> less is more <laughs> less, less is, is more, more like, yeah, yeah. with a, a limited amount of, of microphones so um, there's value in that because you learn how phase really works you learn um, what difference it makes when you move a mic a little bit and how to position those mics well and you'll find that getting a really good punchy sound with not as many mics will t- even will maybe even turn out punchier and better than doing the same thing with more mics because you have more mm-hmm. phase issues more bleed and everything and once you have that down once you know where to to place those four mics, you can always add more for the stuff that isn't covered uh, properly yet. But it's it's a great idea to start with that before you um, do it with a lot more mics and just introducing more pr- more problems. Definitely, um, that really kind of drives the first point home is that you have to think about what what your goal is, what what is the context um, and the reference, like sonic reference of what you're trying to achieve. Um, because it actually gets pretty simple when you only have four channels to work with. You just kind of like think of a drum sound in your head and it becomes pretty clear what the main contributing factors to that are. You know, big, huge, roomy sound. Well, you're probably going to want to consider the room mic situation uh, where really tight, punchy, kick and snare focused, mono, that, you know, it's like it's almost in the name. You just ha- focus on those core elements, the kick and snare in that case, right? Um, so the first question you have to ask yourself is what are you trying to achieve? Yeah. Isn't it funny that this is always kind of the first question, like the whole goal and sound in your yeah. head thing. And it's so weird because it seems so logical. But when I, I remember when I was starting out, I never really thought about that. I just started. I just started, yeah. put microphones up, record it, whatever. And then I kind of tried to figure out if that was good or not. But I, I never really... Uh, followed that that sound in my head or tried to achieve that, but that's actually how you do it. And right yeah. nowadays, when I when I teach people and everything we say on this podcast is basically about the same theme of having a vision, having a goal, and then just following the right steps until you reach that that goal. And it's like it, it's it's so simple, but it it really is the way to go. And it makes things decisions so much easier because it's then then there's just certain decisions that make sense and others that don't. And yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> what what we're trying to like drive home, I think, is that you can't just do what the like the last thing you saw. Like um, when you're starting out, it's really tempting just to be like, okay, well, this is how the sound guy at the show did it. I'm going to do it that way because um, it's all you know. Uh, or it's just the last thing that worked for you, um, and you really have to be flexible in this industry to get the results you want. Because what worked on one song will not necessarily work on another. Yeah. Totally. So what would you do, like, let's say, if you're talking about the goals, let's say we're, what we what we both work most on is, I think, modern rock music, some sort of modern, loud rock music. So for something like that, um, let's say you record a rock track, it should sound modern, it should be something that can be maybe played on the radio. So, so not a really niche or noisy thing, but just a, like, clear punchy, loud rock track, mm-hmm. and you only have four inputs, what would you do or what would be the first things that you would focus on, actually? Right. I mean, I'm always, I could say like 99.9% of the time going to have a kick and snare mic up. Um, so uh, like inside the front of the kick mic and then a top snare mic. Um I, I I can't really imagine a situation where I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, you'd almost need to not have those drums for me to not mic them. Um, so that's where I would start. Um, but then, depending on uh, the song and and again the like sonic goal of what we're trying to achieve, it would change from there. Because um, I've had I can't even remember what song I did this on, but I didn't do rooms or overheads on one song. It was just kick, snare, and toms. And it turned out awesome. There was enough bleed um, for like a cool cymbal sound. We wanted this distorted, like, you know, uber compressed, pumpy thing. And the the bleed just kind of got brought up through all of that. So that really worked in this, this situation where we wanted like close mic only, you know. But in most cases, I would probably do, and I wonder if this is what you do. I'd do kick, snare, and an XY uh, overhead. 
Um, I think that would be my go-to with four mics. <laughs> and so if anybody doesn't know what an XY setup is, by the way, that's when you get uh, two mics and you put the capsules together at the same point so that the sound is hitting them at the same time. And that results in this like really near perfect phase relationship for those two mics. Um, so that makes for a really easy and consistent uh, overhead setup because the phase is going to be really simple to deal with and uh, makes a, a, a kind of a narrower stereo image than some like than say a space pair overhead setup but uh really punchy and you can't really screw it up <laughs> exactly yeah so the definition would exactly be 90 degrees and get the capsules to, as close together as possible mm -hmm. um that would be the, the quote-unquote correct xy setup and it's exactly what malcolm says it's not too wide but it's super accurate when with an xy the only difference is like the level the, the sound pressure difference in the microphones because the mm -hmm. microphones are pointing at different parts of the kit, but they are in the same spot. So there's no time difference. There's just the sound pressure difference. And if you put the microphones apart, if you do a spaced pair, so like the, the, the overhead setup that you've probably seen the most on pictures, like where's one overhead on one side of the kit and then one on the other side, or like an ORTF, which is like the exact specs are 110 degrees, 17 centimeters apart, or roughly 6.7 inches apart uh, in the right. middle of the kit. With those setups, where the capsules are not in the exact same place, you have the sound pressure, the sound level difference, but you also have a time difference. And that time difference um, causes cancellations, causes it to sound a little wider. It's like a psychoacoustic effect that happens there. And but what also happens is the the image is not as accurate, whereas an XY is not wide, but super accurate, and you can spot exactly where the toms are and the symbols are. It's like an accurate representation of the stereo image of the kit. And because of the XY will likely be somewhere around the center of the kit, you will have a pretty strong kick and snare in the overheads, and you will have some toms, especially like the rack tom in the overheads. So that can be a pretty cool thing to do with limited... Um, Inputs, I absolutely agree. And I would probably yep. do the same as you did because you were asking. Um, I have two two examples that I can tell people um, of approaches that I had to, to do. And uh, it totally depended, like, as we said, it totally depends on the song and the goal that you're uh, trying to achieve. So two years ago, I, w I remember I was mixing a pop-punk record and the band only had four inputs. And they wanted a very modern uh, pop punk sound, which is difficult to do with four inputs because you normally you would you would use a pair of overheads, you would use um, room mics, and then you would close mic everything basically to get it super punchy and defined. But they only had four, and what they did was they did exactly that. They did kick snare and an overhead pair. I don't remember if it was X Y, but it was like two overheads. But what I had to do then, and it, I it, I couldn't make it work. What I had to do then was I used those microphones. I added samples, but I also I added MIDI notes like manually. Draw I drew in the MIDI notes for the toms because there were not as many tom films, and I just looked at the overhead tracks, figured out where the tom hits were, and then I just programmed the toms to these overhead tracks and like put samples in there and chose samples that sounded natural and organic with the overheads, and it sounded like there were tom mics. So I, I had that, and then I triggered room samples along with it, and all of a sudden I had a full kit going with just four inputs. So that was one right. story where it worked out really well. I did another project where we did something completely different. So we also had the overheads, but we did not do kick and snare, but we did only the toms, two toms. And the oh, reason wow. for that was because it was the opposite um, like songwriting thing, like the opposite um, thing as with the pop punk record. There was a very simple kick and snare patterns and not too many complicated things, but there were very complicated tom fills and rolls and it was like a noisy type of song. And programming those toms would have been so tedious and also would probably have sounded pretty fake because there was a lot of detail right. and all these fast tom rolls and everything. So programming that wouldn't, be, it wouldn't have been as awesome. So I decided to use the tom mics for the toms and just trigger or program kick and snare instead because that was the right. easy part it was just like basic kick and snare patterns and you could easily program that but the tom parts would have been too hard to to um, recreate so it totally depends on the song and what you're going for 
And uh, yeah, and then we did the same thing, room mics, uh, room samples and everything. And it worked out just fine. You were uh, programming the kick and snare uh, visually to the overhead mic then, in that case? Yes, exactly. I think I was able to trigger the snare because the snare was the loudest thing in the overheads. So oh, I yeah, didn't have cool. to program it. I just uh, detected the loudest hits and then triggered it automatically Great. with a little help manually, I think. But And the kick, I pretty much uh, put the notes in there by hand. Yeah. Right. But it was That's still awesome. easier, but it was still much easier, like after, the, especially after it was edited. Uh, and I, I could just like put the MIDI notes in there, quantize it, and then go in and correct it a bit so that it matched like with the overheads. And also the overheads were filtered, so there was a high-pass filter, so there was not much of a phase problem between the kick sample and the overheads. So it was right. pretty easy to do compared to the very complicated tom fills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's very cool. Um, a, a situation that just came to mind for me was a band that wanted... Like straight up said, they wanted the Led Zeppelin drum sound. So I was like, oh, okay, well, what we'll do is the Glenn Johns miking technique, which is like, you know, it's just famous for that Led Zeppelin sound. Um, so and that's a like usually a four mic setup anyways, I think, you know, I, I can't remember if Glenn Johns did the kick and snare or if he just did the kick. But anyways, I did it with the kick and snare. And then uh, in this case, you've got like essentially a mono overhead above the drummer and then another uh microphone kind of off the the floor tom um to the side and you kind of automate that in as needed or or sometimes you can leave it up depending on the performance but it's it's a really cool sound it's got a sound you know um and it's amazingly well balanced and and huge sounding um but that's just like another example of what's the situation what what does it call for and we want Led Zeppelin drums. Well, let's do it the, the Led Zeppelin way. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. The Glenn, the Glenn Johns is great for that, and it's it, as you said, it's generally a great idea to try. I I like it actually pretty much. Like I think they used a kick drum in the original uh, the way they did it, but I, I'm not sure if they used a close mic kick drum or if they just put a third microphone at the same distance in front of the kit because that's what many people do. So you oh. basically have one mic like 40 to 60 inches over the snare drum of the center of the snare. One at the exact same distance over the rim of the floor tom, um, pointing across the kit at the hi hats, and then you have a third microphone, either as a close mic bass drum microphone or in front of the kit again at the, with the same distance to the center of the snare. So it will pick up a little bit of the kit of the kick drum low end outside of the kick, but it will also pick up a little bit of all the shells and maybe some cymbals, but in front of the kick. I think that that's maybe what they did, but I, I'm not sure. But either way, you can. You can do whatever you want. You can add a snare drum. You can add a close mic kick drum. You can do the front of the off kit thing, um, and then you pan the microphone over the snare drum. You pan that halfway to one side, and the mic over the tom. You pan that all the way to the other side, and then you get a pretty balanced, cool stereo image of the kit. It's not mm-hmm. like exactly a natural image like the X Y, but it's a pretty wide, pretty cool image, and it keeps the kick and snare in the center. So. That might be worth trying. And you get a lot of ambience, a lot of ring and resonances from the shells. It like makes the kit really sing. And that's what that Zeppelin basically did. And if you do that in a room that's vibey, vibey and, and like live as well, then it gets really exciting. Like if you it's probably more exciting in a big open space than it is in the small um um dad room. But yeah, anyway, it's a great way to get some ambience, to get some vibe and yeah, try that. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, and and taking these old techniques, classic techniques, and and messing with them to, and adding, like, because, for example, I'm like, okay, well, I want it to be a little bit more modern, so having a close kick and snare, it was like, I'm just not going to go without that because I still want those to be able to just, like, really punch. Um, so you can always tweak these things to, to suit your needs. Yeah, and what about, what would you do if, say... You have a band that wants mono drums or is okay with mono drums, so they don't need the image. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I know a famous example would be in the heavy music world would be there's a band called Code Orange. They used to be called Code Orange Kids in the beginning, I think. Now they call Code okay. Orange. It's a very, very heavy hardcore band. Kurt Ballou produced some of their records. And um, I know there's one record, and I think Kurt Ballou did it, where the drums are completely mono, the guitars are super wide. And it sounds insane. It sounds a little like 
it sounds kind of crazy because you have this very focused mono but super punchy modern drums in the dead center. Then there's basically a hole left and right of that. And then on the outsides are the very wide, super aggressive guitars. But it sounds pretty, pretty cool. And um, mm -hmm. so let's say a band wants something like that or they just don't care about the image and the drums can be mono. What would you do then? Like, how would you go about the overheads? And what would you do maybe with one microphone that right. is left then if you just put a yeah. mono overhead there? I would do kick, snare, mono overhead, and then mono room, um, like depending on the room. The, the room would dictate where that, mo that mono room ends up. Um, but I would definitely take advantage of, of that extra spot with a room, I think. Um, the exception being if it's like, uh, sometimes there's songs that really need a hi-hat mic to me. Like if they're just chomping on it and that's like the really important part of the beat is the hi-hat, then I might choose to get close on that. But then I might do a close on that and still go with the room instead of the overhead even. Um, but yeah, mono mono drums can be really cool. I love it actually. Um, and yeah, I know it's, it's awesome. I, like a mono overhead, especially like sometimes I'll do a mono overhead, but still do stereo rooms. And and that can be really cool as well. Um, so like, because uh, generally my rooms are quite a bit further than my overheads are. Um, and so it's kind of, that brings up the width, uh, but the overhead is still really punchy and up the middle. It, it's quite a, you can really manipulate the stereo image with those guitars like you were kind of just describing. They kind of seem to sit out extra wide when there isn't a very wide drum kit in the mix. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's all circumstantial, of course. But I would say most cases do a mono overhead and a mono room. Yeah, that sounds that sounds cool to me because if you think of a band like when you're watching a band live, if you think of a stage, mm -hmm. you don't like you don't hear the drums like super wide usually. Like it's like if it's a festival in the big PA, then yes, if everything is mic'd and they do stereo or whatever. But if you go to a club or if you just listen to a band like what's coming off the stage you don't hear stereo drums. Like you hear the drum kit in the middle of the stage and you hear the guitar cabs left and right of it. And that's basically what it sounds like when you position that in a mix that way. So it's actually a more authentic, organic representation of a band like positioning their stuff on a stage or in a room. Right. Like you're really having, yeah, you don't, you don't listen to a real drum kit with your ears right at the drum kit so you can hear left and right. You're always listening to it from a distance and then it will get very narrow actually. So, mm -hmm. yeah, for organic stuff, that abs absolutely makes sense. I'm just curious about the mono overhead, how I would position that. It's it's interesting because you said the hi-hats. It's interesting because I don't typically mic, I, I always mic the hi-hats if I can, but I, I most of the time I don't even use that mic. Right. I, I sometimes use it for when I want very detailed articulation, like extra top end and very detailed stuff. But in the scenario that you described when someone was really like hitting the hi-hat uh, hard and it's the main part of the of the beat i find that in those cases the hi-hats are usually pretty loud on the overheads but maybe i'm missing something here maybe you want more di i guess you want it to be more direct not not just volume but more in your face uh, yeah i i guess when i'm going with like a stripped down four mic situation i'm kind of embracing like dirty and and just gonna like i'm assuming that i'm gonna make everything kind of like smack pretty hard so i'd like be more prone to distort a hi-hat with like devil lock which is a plugin that i absolutely love or something like that you know and <clears throat> um and for me i've only kind of just started realizing this but i tend to like either be heavy with my overhead and light with my room mic or the the reverse so it's like almost like i treat them as the same thing in a weird way that they are uh, providing space and and symbols in a lot of cases, um, and I don't necessarily need both uh, to a huge degree. So in this case, I, if I had like a room mic that was kind of accomplishing my needs for that situation, I might give up on the overhead and and try it somewhere else. Probably not in most cases. Like I think for most songs, an overhead and a room is going to be the right call. But it just really depends on like what the song is. You know, and if if you're only using four inputs, it's not the same as having like eighteen to twenty four mics going. So you can change it on a song by song basis. That's a huge advantage, actually. Is if you're recording your band with four inputs, and what's working on one song isn't working on the, on the next song, just quickly move one microphone. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, 
Yeah. It's not going to throw everything out of whack like like it could in a, a larger setup. Exactly. And that that brings up a pretty cool way of thinking about it actually for me because what you could then do is you could not use the mono overhead at all and just use a pair of room mics because when you get further away from the kit, you will have, like with a one mono overhead mic, you'll be pretty close to the kit still. So depending on where you point it, like some parts of the kit will be louder than others. You probably mm-hmm. won't be able to get both crashes equally or the hi hat or the ride. Something will suffer probably. Yep. But if you go a little further away from the kit, if you use room mics, you can have the whole kit on those room mics more. And you could even use a pair so you get some image, like some width. It's not like really mono, but you don't get a, an accurate image and not super wide drums, but you can do like, you can have some width and it's not just a super mono thing, which can be cool. Right. So in that case, it might be worth thinking about not doing overheads at all, but just kick snare and a pair of room mics, depending on what your room sounds like, of course. But yes. that could be a good idea just because of the distance, because you get yeah. further away from the kit and that will make the balance better. And if you want ambience, that could be cooler than one mono overhead and one mono room mic. It could be cooler to just use stereo room mics. Yep, definitely. And room, like really roomy drum recordings are really in style right now. Um, so experiment with your room, see if you can unlock something kind of magical in it. Um, Cause like each room's different, so that's where you can kind of find this hidden character that really makes your sound stand out a little bit, I think. Um, but being the devil's advocate, another cool approach is to not focus on the room at all. Uh, so, you know, kick snare, maybe just like a, a mono overhead, and then that extra mic gets to go live on whatever is most important. Or maybe it's a stereo overhead, whatever. But then you could always go the route of uh, using room samples or on your close mics, or uh, busting them out to like a reverb uh, to create like kind of a faux room um, setup. So that's just like where you're taking your mics that you've recorded, throwing them to an aux track, throwing a reverb on that, and kind of creating an artificial room um, that you can kind of blend to taste, which can be really awesome as well. Um, I don't have to do that too often, but it's definitely saved my butt a few times. Absolutely. Well, like that, uh, and so many ideas pop up right now because I just I get excited when we talk about this because I love room mics and I love exciting vibe character mics and things like that. So there are so many things that you could actually do. And now I'm just thinking of that right now when while we're doing this. So what you could do would be the reverb thing, or you could do, and I did that a couple of times. You could record overheads and kick and snare, and then you or kick snare and toms and no overheads, whatever, and then. You could, and I did that, and it, it's actually pretty exciting. And then you could play back that recording, get a balance that sounds cool, and then put that out through your speakers, put a speaker in a cool room, and re- record mm. that room, like reamping rooms, basically. And yeah. that can be super cool. You can take a speaker to whatever room sounds great, um, turn up the drums that you recorded, put a microphone in a cool spot, record that, and then blend that in with the, the recording that you did before. That way you can do you can use the inputs again. So you have four inputs, but then you have an like another four inputs when you do the the reamping thing basically mm-hmm. or re-rooming thing. So that can be really exciting and unique. Because what I like about those techniques is it's always unique. If you use room samples, someone else, if it's not your own samples, someone else will use the same room samples. And if you are creating your own um, room sounds, that is what really ma- gives the character to the drums, even if you use samples on the close mics. And if you can come up with some unique space and ambience and room, that is always exciting, I think. So you could absolutely do that. Or you could set up, um, if your room is not too exciting or if your room is not too big and it's not really ambient and you don't get an exciting uh, room sound, you could still come up with cool ideas to create that. So one thing I did in a very small room once, it was absolutely fantastic, very vibey and unique, so not suitable for every situation, but it's worth a try, is first thing is that's a pretty basic technique, but you can point the room mic away from the kit. So you can put it as far as possible from the kit and then turn it like 180 degrees away from the kit, which makes the room appear to be a little bigger. Mm-hmm. So that can be cool, and you get usually get less symbols and more shells, and yeah, that that could be cool. Or you could put a big if you have something like that, you can take a big ride symbol or something like that that like 
resonates and rings when there's loud noise in the room. Put that ride symbol on a stand somewhere, like away from the, as far away as possible from the kit. And then behind that ride symbol, you can put a microphone and mic, mic up that symbol. And that symbol right. will ring and resonate. It will also be a little shield, so you won't have as much symbols actually coming into the mic. So it will be a little a more shells. And that ride symbol will add some ambience and some almost like a reverb. And it's it's it sounded very cool when I tried that. So you can awesome. do weird things like that. Or just find something in the room, some weird spot in the room where you can throw the mic in and see what it sounds like. Maybe you have uh, like a radiator that rings like crazy when some when you play drums and you can throw a yeah. mic behind that. Or I don't know. Like I heard a story of, again, Kurt Ballou, who was doing a record in another room with a band, not at his studio. And there was, for whatever reason, there was a canoe uh, hanging on the wall in that room. And he just put a mic inside that canoe and used that as a vibe and ambient mic. So you yeah. can do whatever whatever you want. I think you, totally. Malcolm, you told me about the tree trunk yeah. or whatever yeah, I thing. Say, like, that's down the road at a studio called Silverside Sound. They have like this big, huge tree root. Um, like it's just massive old gnarly tree root um, strapped to a wall. Looks really cool, but I throw an SM57 in there every time I'm recording drums there and yeah. just crush it. You know, it's just like, <laughs> and sometimes it works, sometimes it's just garbage, but I'm going to do it either way because the band loves it and it's fun for me. And <laughs> yeah. it's just like, yeah, we got to try this. So there's, they also have like this, uh, this studio it used to be a winery. So there's like this big old, like, uh, like cask for wine <laughs> and uh, we just like uncorked it and threw a mic in there one day and that sounded terrible but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was like you know fun to try um, sure yeah I, I had uh, a more advanced idea but I think a really cool idea um, for people with limited inputs uh, uh, that I think is really perfect for like the four input situation and that is this idea of like if you still want the hi-fi drum um, sound of close mic everything, or at least most things. What you could do is close mic your kick, snare, and toms. Um, hopefully, you only have two toms, <laughs> and then actually overdub your cymbals. Oh yeah. So record just the shells uh, with them close close mic, or or you know they, it doesn't have to be that way. You can still have room mics on them or whatever. But I, I would probably go close mic in this scenario, and then you strip that and set up overheads and rooms or spot mics on the cymbals, whatever you decide sounds best, and then just record the cymbals to your previously recorded shells. So you're overdubbing the cymbals, which is like a more modern approach that is becoming pretty popular. Um, I know that Royal Blood did that on their stuff, and and Nothing But Thieves, two, two bands that are really killing it with the massive sounding recordings these days. Um, and that would help that would really overcome the problem for you if if you really think you need more inputs you can just do it this way yeah absolutely i i think though it's absolutely worth trying i think though that it's pretty hard to do i've never done yeah. it personally but i've heard from from people and i can imagine that it's pretty hard and that there is this story of lamb of god did that and uh, they mm -hmm. did it on a, on a metal record and i i and i think i don't know if you've ever downloaded those stems we are both like nail the mix subscribers like URM subscribers where you get a like multi tracks every month to mix and there was a Lamb of God session where we got the original multi tracks for a Lamb of God song where they did it that way and I downloaded that and listened to it and it's I mean Chris Adler's playing is insane and uh, anyway but and he's one of the greatest metal drummers ever but um like it's insane what he pulled off there. Like to imagine separating that in your brain, oh. like the the feet and the shells, and then the symbols, and doing that in separate takes, it requires uh, you to, to be I don't know a, a beast of a drummer. And it's people think that it's easy. And there's the story where people were saying, "Oh, it's all fake," and Chris Adler couldn't play like the drums on that record, and so they did symbols and shells separately. But that's actually not the case at all. Mm -hmm. Of course, he can play that, and he's one of the greatest drummers, and he does live like a, he does a perfect performance live. They just did it for sonic reasons, and it was actually very, very hard to do. Yeah, it's very tricky. And I think you actually need a good drummer to do that. It's not like a, a crutch if you can't play the parts. You need to be able to really play it, and uh, and it's yeah, it has to yeah. be super tight. Otherwise, it will sound weird. So it, it requires total pre-production, like we talked about in I think the previous episode or two yeah. two episodes ago. Uh, yeah. It you really got to have that lined up in advance, rehearsed that way. You have to have some kind of solution for it. Like sometimes they'll put sponges on the stands so they have something to play. You know, uh, 
it's definitely tricky. And it's not only tricky for the player, it's also tricky for the engineer, whoever's running the computer. Because you're going to end up with a mountain of tracks that you have to make sure stay synced up. You have to make sure that if you do any editing, you've got them both in mind. Um, you have to explain it to whoever you're sending it to mix it. You know, like it's, it's a big thing. Um, definitely not for the faint of heart or undetermined. Um, but I, that said, I've done it. And it was cool. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Um, totally great idea, especially if for the modern stuff. Ironically, so it's not a, a, like it's it's not only a way to overcome those four inputs. It's also it may be a good idea sonically because you can then, without using samples or with very minimal sample use, you can just crush like the the close mics compress a lot. You can get a lot of attack and ambient and ambience and vibe out of those without bringing the cymbals up. And yep. you have total control over the symbols as well. You can have a really smooth top end and really punchy symbols and you can uh, and, and really punchy shells. So it actually opens up a lot of opportunities that you not ha- that you don't have when everything's on every mic, basically. Yes, definitely. Also, that brings up another thing that I haven't thought of um, when we're prepping this episode, but it's also a thing that getting that's getting more and more popular, and many people are doing it or have been doing it for a long time. Is if you have a MIDI input you could use a kick pad you yep. could like completely get rid of the kick drum you could p- use your four inputs for i don't know um overhead snare and room mic or mono overhead snare and toms or whatever and mm-hmm. then just put a kick pad there and trigger and let like, just capture the midi notes and then trigger the kick drum and many people do that even though they have enough inputs, but in metal it's totally common to do that because you get a very consistent kick drum sound. You have no kick drum bleed in the overheads. Um, so that would also be an option, actually, using a, a kick pad. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's like now that we're going down this rabbit hole in metal, <laughs> there's so many options. Uh, like, yeah. you know, maybe metal bands on that topic, they was like, you know, sometimes there's like a little splash symbol or a china symbol that's really important to them, but doesn't really like often it's like way too far away from the kit or like in like the center, which doesn't really sound awesome sometimes. Uh, so you can just overdub those single elements, you know, rather than like having to set up a whole like pair of stuff. You could just spot mic one mic, have them hit that. You could place it wherever you want just manually. Um, you know, so you can kind of split things up and get creative that way. Uh, one more idea for the limited input s- solutions kind of s- stuff is that you could record your own samples of room so, uh, shots as well you know so if you want to have close mic toms and everything so you can't really afford to have the uh, the room mics up or something you could just set up room mics and get like samples of each drum individually or something and then that might give you some flexibility down the road when when you hand it off to mixing so they have like the sound of your room on these close mics that they might be able to use if they want to absolutely that's that's a, a very good idea actually and yeah again it all comes down to what the song requires, what the sound is that you're going for. If you want it super tight and close and defined, if you want more vibe or both and you can do overdubs or whatever, it's just very important to have that plan before you start and not just think, okay, uh, like everybody does overheads, everybody does kick and snare, so that's what we need to do. Like there are no yeah. hard rules, not at all. There's just one thing I would try to do at all times usually, and that is it, no matter what you do, I would try to keep the kick and snare in the center of the image most of the time. So I would try to do that. I would always be careful with phase. We've covered that in, I don't know, what, what episode was it? I have to look that up. Um, if you don't know what drum phase is, because this is very rele- relevant to this episode as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was episode number four. Um, so be careful with the phase. Be careful with keeping like equal distance from the snare drum and kick drum, or at least the snare drum, whenever you put up overheads and Glenn Johns, Recorder Man, whatever. Um, then just decide what what's the, the right vibe for your song. And by the way, I just said it, but I think we haven't touched on it. Like There's a technique called Recorder Man, which is also uh, pretty interesting, and I, I mm-hmm. like that a lot, actually. And it is when you put one mic... Uh, 32 inches above the center of the snare drum and another mic 32 inches from the snare drum as well, but over the right shoulder of the drummer. So it basically sounds like that mic sounds kind of what the drummer hears when he's playing or she's playing the drums. And you keep those two mics like equal dis- at equal distance from the, from the snare, pan them hard left and right, and you get a pretty exciting picture of the kit as well. And that, that mic over the shoulder pretty much captures the whole kit 
pretty well. So you have the symbols, you have the toms and everything. And that can be also a very cool idea. You can also like use kick, snare, room, and just that mic over the shoulder, for example, to capture the whole kit. That could also be cool. Um, mm. Again, no hard rules here. And the last thing I wanted to add, and I wanted to ask you if you've ever done that, because I always do that also with multi mic setups, and like that's that mic is always there no matter what I do. Sometimes I use it in the mix, sometimes not. But I always like to have one I call it trash mic or dirt mic uh, microphone in the center, in the middle of the drum kit, like right above the rim of the kick drum on the beater side. Uh, right. Like it's very close to the rectum, very close to the snare. And I compress the shit out of it. Sometimes I run it through a Sans amp or some guitar pedal or whatever just to destroy it. And um, it's it's very snappy. has very, very a lot of attack. It has a lot of the beater attack from the kick drum, which is a different sound on the outside than it is on the inside of the kick, which is pretty exciting. Yep. And it has a lot of the ring of the shells. So I really like that. It glues the kit together. It just pumps and it has energy. And it almost sounds like an ambient mic sometimes just because of the, the ring of the shells. And I don't know, do, do you do such a thing? Do you have a, 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 a spot where you like to put a mic in like yeah. close to the kit? I mean, I've got my tree mic uh, yeah. going. <laughs> yeah. But uh, generally, there's always something I've set up that is trying to null the symbols as much as possible. Um, so like to reject the symbols is what I mean by that. Um, often for me, it's a ribbon mic, so it's a figure eight and I kind of like get the off access, uh, on the symbols and then, uh, that's going to be crushed a hundred percent of the time. Um, so it's not normally in the position you're talking about for me. Um, often it's kind of like more out front. I call it like a front of kit mic, yeah. um, with the, the null at the symbols, but, uh, I experiment with it pretty often. Um, actually like a, a a fun thing for me talking that we talked about earlier in this episode about switching it up on a song by song basis is moving that mic uh, where I need it. So like I've got everything else and then I've got this one trash mic that I'm moving around and adjusting the how much I'm trashing it uh, based on the song, you know, so like it might be like this dirty mic that's kind of up close for one song and then the next song I don't want a dirty drum sound. So I'll pull it back and it's just like another mono room that's more pretty and I've loosened up the compression, you know, all buttons uh, in mode is switched off on the 1176 now. And <laughs> um, so I've, I've always got something like that, but it, it's not really a crucial thing for me. Uh, and it's not something that I'm always doing the same way. Okay. Yeah, that's, but again, you're trying to find something that has vibe and unique character. Yeah. Because as you said, like that's, first of all, that's popular right now. So vibey, roomy drums are popular. Um, and second of all, it's cool to have a unique sound and it's cool to have people. I would rather risk, I would rather do something risky. It could be, and that it would be super cool that people listen to a record you've done and they like, wow, the drum sound on that record. I want to sound like that. That's super insane. Right. I wonder what they've done. So that for me is the goal. I, I always want people to recognize a certain sound and I don't want them to go like, okay, this sounds like that other record that I like. I want them to mm -hmm. listen to the record and think, wow, that sound is what I want to have, or uh, how did they do it? That sounds crazy. So I always want to, um, yeah, to get a unique sound, and I want that to become a reference, right. rather than trying to recreate what somebody else did. And that's yep. some, that's risky, of course, but I think that's like art is not safe, and if it's exciting yeah. to me, so yeah, yeah. I think if you fall into that camp, my recommendation would be kick snare and one overhead or room. You know, like one balanced kind of kit image mic that's either overhead or a room and then use that fourth channel because we're talking about only having four inputs use that fourth channel as your like magic mic and <laughs> throw it wherever yeah. you need yeah. and, and get get funky with that i think every mixer would agree that they can probably make a good close kick and snare and one general kit mono image they can make that sound good yeah you know so you'll be covered in that situation um so like you can get pretty funky with that extra mic if you have those other three bases covered. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And it's probably a good idea to have yeah, to have those basic mics and to have them clean and like position carefully so that you actually capture everything that's essential uh and then start with the vibe thing because as much as I love it you're totally right if you don't have that at all it can be very yeah. risky and very difficult to get a uh a great a great sound for the mixer. So yeah. Yeah, definitely. Try to get some some basic balanced thing and 
how would you go about deciding, like, um, like again, that, that question that I asked before, how would you go about deciding where to point that one overhead microphone? It's like, would you prioritize certain parts of the kit depending on the song, or would you even move it, like, during a song? Like, do one part with a mic pointing it that direction and then another part, like, where it points somewhere else? Or I mean, I, I guess you definitely could. You definitely could. Um yeah, you know what? It changes. Uh, it's like sometimes I really want that snare to be present in the overhead. Sometimes I that's the exact opposite of what I want. Mm. And it's just meant to be there for symbols, right? Um, so I, I don't know if there's a, an answer for that. Uh, the, like, I, like we've been saying, room is so in right now that I might prioritize like a more mono room sound, which is kind of trying to get everything in it, you know, which is easier in a room. Um, so like, you know, I'm just going to head out center, <laughs> yeah. probably six feet back, you know, uh, probably down lower because symbols get in there no matter what. Um, but uh, you do have to experiment and it, it depends on your room. And if you don't have a room, you know, like I've, I've always got the luxury of there being space in front of the drum kit to have a room at least six feet away. Uh, that could not be the case for a lot of people. So, yeah. you know, you might be better off with an overhead. Yeah, I would probably move it a little like either back behind, like where the drummer sits or the other way around and then angle it a bit and point it at the kit. Maybe I um, I think you could get more of the overall kit that way instead of just having it straight up in the, the center. And because then if a crash or whatever symbol is or rise symbol or whatever is like off center, it could be difficult to capture that in the center of the kit. Yeah, I don't know if an omnidirectional mic would make sense. If you have a cloud above the drums, maybe you could try that and use an omnidirectional microphone yeah. that picks up. That could be very cool. Everything around it that could be cool, but I probably would would try and, and angle it a bit and, and put it a little, pull it a little out out of the kit and try to get everything in there as much as possible. I think that's that's what I would do, and that's kind of brings me to the last thing that I want to add here um, that you shouldn't overlook probably, and that is. Whenever you point, and that's also dangerous with X, Y setups, by the way, whenever you point a microphone at the kit or at the cymbals, like an overhead or that mono mic or whatever, be careful when you, especially when you angle it and it points at a crash cymbal, for example, the cymbal will move when you hit it. And right. a cymbal, the way the the sound, like the way it projects sound is like there's underneath straight underneath and straight above the symbol that's where the sound is to the sides of the symbol there is a null point there is nothing basically and the symbol moves and up or up uh, above and below there you can pick up sound and at the side of the symbol it cancels and if you point an xy configuration for example in the center of the kit with the mic's angle 90 90 degrees and the mic points at a um, a crash symbol, and that crash symbol moves. You can't see what I'm doing right now, but the crash symbol will move, and it will move past the microphone potentially. And mm -hmm. at the at that moment where the symbol, like the edge of the symbol, faces that microphone, there will be a cancellation, and it will be a very washy, weird kind of symbol sound if you right. do that. So you have to be careful to be high enough above the symbols, or to not point directly at the edge of a symbol to avoid that. So that's that's why I prefer having the microphone point at the center of the cymbals more than at the edge, because when the cymbal moves, as I said, and depending on how, how tight they are on the stands and everything, but when the cymbals move, and they usually move a lot, then you can get this weird, phasey, washy cymbal sound. And if you don't know where that comes from, and I've heard that often in, in recordings that people send me, that's a common thing. Sometimes it's a comb filter effect from reflections from the ceiling, but sometimes it's just the placement of the overhead mics. Mm -hmm. And um, to avoid that, you can try to point the microphone at the center of the cymbals and avoid putting it too low so that it's basically next to the cymbals. Um, yeah, that's just one thing yeah. I want to add here. So if you encounter that, if you encounter such a weird, phasey cymbal sound, that might be the problem. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, yeah, and so that could be placement of the overheads. It could be the move. You could also place the cymbals in different spots, you yeah. know, to, to make up for that. Um uh, raise or lower the symbols, you know. So it was just there's solve that problem. <laughs> what exactly. it comes down to, exactly. But, yeah, I mean, like we, I think we started this episode thinking we'd talk about half of these ideas, and yeah. half of them came as we talked. And so that really just shows, like, four inputs is no excuse. Um, that that there's plenty you can do with that. Um, like actually, I, I've talked about it a couple times, but I work on this documentary show where that it's meant to be a, well it is about rhythm so I'm, I'm going all over the world 
interviewing and recording drummers for this documentary. And uh, I travel with an eight-channel interface, but generally I have to have a couple of those channels for lav mics and boom mics and stuff like that, dialogue mics. So sometimes I only have four channels to record drums. And I mean, it, it kind of sucks. You know, you got like Manu Kachie of the police and stuff or, or sting i should say not the police um but uh like the, the world the one of the, the most famous drummers ever and i only have four mics to work with i'm like <laughs> okay well this still has to kick ass and it will because it's monocaccia like he just sounds unbelievable no matter what but i you know it's like i have to get creative um, i have to make it work no matter what and you, you definitely can absolutely and that's just an, such a nice way to end that episode because what you just Uh, said here basically was no matter what you do it's still the most important thing to just play an amazing song with amazing technique in a great sounding room and if there's a great drummer he or she will sound good no matter what basically like that's still the most important thing and even one microphone or two microphones or whatever that you point at this amazing drummer will still sound amazing so don't uh, be afraid to record drums just because of your limited track count um mm-hmm. and yeah if if what you're playing is actually good and if you're playing it with good technique or if you have a great drummer just find a way to make it work but um the performance will speak for itself usually definitely awesome that has been a great episode actually it's one of my favorites i guess because we just thought of so many things during the during the episode and it kind of got got me excited to go out and, and experiment with drums right now it's yeah, like, yeah drums no. are my favorite thing to do anyway so uh <laughs> four channel drums is all i'm doing from now on yeah <laughs> i guess so like i'm really i love drums i don't know about you but i love drums in general like and i always i think it's, it's also that thing that i i tend to mix very loud drums and oftentimes yep. people will tell me to put the guitar pull uh, like turn the guitar up more or turn the vocals up more because I'm focusing so much on the drums. Yeah. And I'm always like, what's your damn problem? Like, drums are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Must be the guitarist asking for that. Yeah, for Yeah, sure. who needs guitars? <laughs> like, you hear the guitar is good. That's all I need. Like, <laughs> That's no. so funny. Yeah. Um, but anyway, go out, experiment with that. Um, and maybe I would, I would find it really cool if people would actually do do that, do the experimenting, and then send us their recordings so we can listen to what they come up with. That would be really oh, exciting. Be, so awesome, if you yeah. if you're uh yeah, if you want to do that, that would be really amazing. Experiment, come up with some cool sounds, send it to us. Uh that would be awesome. You can do that by emailing to podcast at the self recording band dot com. And I will absolutely listen to it. And if it's cool, I will um maybe we'll talk about it on the on the podcast. But I would yeah. definitely love to to hear that. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully you enjoyed that and thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks. See you next week. Bye. Bye.